So I am monitoring. Uh, so I'm monitoring questions in three places. So off of the broadcast itself, uh, live streaming off of my Facebook stream, my Facebook page, as well as there's a watch party that's running over on the Office 365 community on Facebook as well. So you can post questions to those three locations. Um, we're simulcasting and, uh, and we'll try to address those. So as other folks join, uh, if you're watching, if you'd like to join in, ask questions directly to us. Um, if you're not a fan of Facebook and want to ask your questions over in the meeting, yes, we are hosting this on Zoom and, and we'll have, I'm sure, half a dozen people that, uh, you know, say like, why are you presenting this on Zoom? Why, are, why is the Microsoft community broadcasting things on Zoom? Is because, folks, we're live streaming and you cannot live stream simulcast to social networks from Teams. Uh, and so we're, we have to use a third party technology. So rather than using two tools, we're using one tool that uh, does this for the live stream. But we are talking about um, uh, setting up with vMix or Mixer, uh, a couple other tools that are out there and moving the discussion um, to, uh, I guess I put that broadcast, man, um, to move this um, all over to uh, the, uh, uh, you know, to teams as soon as possible. Sorry, I'm uh, responding to questions coming in. So we've got panelists that are trying to join that saw the live stream and the broadcast button that I hit. And uh, all right, now I can add people in here. And we have uh, Mr. Sean McDonough that's joining in. Hey, Sean. Good morning, Christian. Yeah, I guess I should have hit that little button that said broadcast. You know, so. <laughs> That's the little things. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all good. But how are, how are things going this morning? Oh, they're going pretty well. It's a nice sunny day here in Cincinnati. And what's the what's the t-shirt you're wearing? Oh. <laughs> Nice. nice. Going out to the developers. Yeah. I, I told you I've got my $6 shirts order that I'm waiting for, still waiting for. Still waiting for? Yeah. I the, I got the, uh, the I, I didn't get, after my order was placed like a week and a half ago, I never got the email confirmation. And so I reached out to support. Did you they, click the buy button? Like oh, I the, did. The yeah, yeah, broadcast yeah. No, button. no, I got I got the cur the confirmation that the transaction happened, but they usually follow up because I've purchased through them before right away with an email saying, "Hey, here's when it's going to be delivered. Here's what's going on." So they mm -hmm. got back and said, "Hey, we're at minimal staff. Everything's mm -hmm. delayed, and so it's going to be like mid May." Ah, uh, yeah. So that's uh, yeah, slight understand. delay. I was just you know not receiving the email. I mean, you don't know, and knowing's half the battle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, GI Joe. So, yeah, let me share, let me share a brief story with you on that. So normally, on Friday, Joe? Uh, not GI Joe this time, um, but Friday nights are typically our movie and pizza night. Mm -hmm. And this past Friday, I went online to order the pizza through the website, and the site was like crawling. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I had a session going on my desktop browser, the mobile app trying to order as well. And I finally get an order submitted after 45 minutes of waiting for this. And I was also trying to call into customer service who put me on a 30 minute hold. So I'm like, are we going to get pizza tonight or not? I'm not quite sure. Well, while I'm waiting for the email confirmation to come through, the pizza gets delivered to the front door. <laughs> so, uh, it's like so, yeah so, so that's a that's a good tip then uh you know that or the good time to tip to make sure so i, I had already done so yes all right excellent hey we, so we've got mike and we've got hans that uh, joined us right. welcome hey how's it going and so uh and for those folks that are, are tuning in so again we're broadcasting or simulcasting the live stream in two locations out on facebook uh, if you have questions, feel free to post. Uh, we are also, uh, uh, so I need to turn on the modules. 
We've got the Q&A and chat modules over, over here um, in uh, Zoom. And I've said this, I said this once at the beginning of the, the broadcast would, before I hit the broadcast button, so nobody was on with me. Because um, we always inevitably get uh, three, four people that are complaining about why are the Microsoft community people, why are MVPs using Zoom? Like, how dare you, sir? How dare you? And the reason is because you're watching this on the live stream and the live stream is brought to you by Zoom. Not possible to do the live stream on social networks uh, directly from Teams yet. I know it's, it's, in the, it's been requested. Uh, and so you have to use a third party tool. And uh, so I use Zoom for webinars. So for public anonymous access webinar. So anyway, I, you know, I stated this, gotten it out of the way. It'll only pop up four or five more times during this hour. <laughs> there are other yeah. reasons. There are other yeah. reasons as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I know. Yeah. So I, I, I've seen some folks that have done, certainly with webinars, you can always use Teams and do the your Teams live and the broadcast, but then there are limitations to that. Uh, and, and so even, even then it, it's, it won't do the simulcast with, you know, it's, I can go and certainly we can invite the world and send a link to anybody to join a webinar. You can do that with any webinar technology. The purpose here is reaching people where they are. And for whatever reason, people are in Facebook. So <laughs> yeah. You're just hey, being... You're just beating your drum, Christian. Uh, you don't uh, hate guardrails. Keep <laughs> running with scissors. I know, that's right. Hey, uh, so I do have uh, something I want to bring up. So I've had uh, a couple questions, uh, but I've seen, uh, so I've had questions on Facebook. I had a blog post. I had somebody that's asked a couple questions um, around planner and, uh, and the task management capability in Teams and integration with Microsoft Project. Anyone else have any experience with those things? I know some folks that have set up flows uh, to, to kind of mitigate. Yeah, believe it or yeah. not. Yeah. Believe we'll, it or not. It's to, work to with mitigate. what we got. Yeah, mitigate with what, you know, what, what you have to get done. You, you know, if you have to use chicken wire and duct tape, that's what you have to do. Well, th this is the, the thing. So I know that we, like, I don't have yet on my tenant, I don't have the new tasks capability in Teams. I'm not sure if it's even started rolling out. They're just sharing pictures and little animated GIFs and things around it. Um, I, I don't think it's there. It should be over on the left rail when it's added. Um, but all that does, that provides you a roll-up view of the to-do app. So it's a, a, you know, a sync between planner and to-do as a, a list on Teams, which is fantastic. But what it doesn't provide is what people are asking for. And I've been asking for, for, you know, when I joined Microsoft in 2006, I've shared this story and I provided feedback coming from the project and portfolio management space. When I joined Microsoft, I mean, I provided tons of feedback as well. Um, but is that portfolio view? Planner is not designed to provide a portfolio view. Uh, it's, it's limited in what it can do. There is a way, and it's not new, it actually from late, the second half of 2017 is where they announced kind of the capability of the way to link a planner app directly to an item on a task on a work breakdown structure in project. It requires project online to do that. So you have to have, and that, you know, project online is a separate license. It's uh, so it's not part of any of the E license, but you could have an E one all the way up and, and uh, subscribe, then pay for those additional licenses and get this capability. I was going to share um, just to, to show you what this looks like really quick. And let me, you know, apologize uh, gents for uh, taking over to answer this question, but it's kind of what we're here for, right? Yeah. Uh, let me. Project's always been the black sheep. Yeah. Well, let me yeah. let me just switch. Even with their own server. Yes. Elitist. Yeah. So uh, let me do this. Microsoft Office servers. Remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it's Microsoft almost all the Office servers. Yeah. So let me share that. Okay. So if you guys can, uh, I guess I'll 
shut this stuff is easy. So when you have multiple plans in planner, so you can have, it's great when Microsoft added the ability to, uh, to have multiple planner plans or boards within a single channel or within a single team. I remember, remember when it was initially, you could just have one and that's, that's it for the, for a team. And so now you can go in and create as many sub plans as you want. Um, and so one of the questions somebody asked on my blog is like, well, for example, if I have a project that's up and running, but then I have a specific campaign, I want to take one task and explode it out and work on it. Well, planner is great at that. However, there's no roll up to manage that within planner. So here I went in. So let's say I have this general plan. I just did these very generic in teams. Uh, these, I created a plan called general plan. And then I created these two uh, campaign plans. So you can see, so I could go into my planner hub and I can see them at this top level, but to get to any of the detail within that, I have to go into them individually. So there's no portfolio view uh, within planner. Of course, I can get into that aggregated that my tasks, I can see them all from my perspective and we're gonna get richer capability when that team's uh, uh, plan uh, or the team's tasks uh, 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 app is added to everyone's tenant. There are a couple articles that I'll point you to if this is something that you're interested in. There's this great uh, blog post by uh, Peter Kestenholtz um, where he talks about, again, this is September 2017, where he actually shows you highlights where you can actually go in and in your project online project plan, you can actually click on the planner icon and you'll see here in this image, it actually will then link that item and it's a soft link. Essentially, in that plan, you'd have to then click over here to jump over to the related planner plan, but you could create then a, a mini work breakdown structure for completing new flyers as a task and then assign it to a bunch of people and go and complete that. Uh, so, you know, otherwise the, what happens is you can export your work breakdown structure in your project plan uh, and create that over in planner with all of its assignments. But then when you do that and you export it, it breaks the, uh, uh, the hereditary uh, from that. It, it, it won't uh, maintain any real time connection between the two other than this soft link. So you can't then go and in planner complete all the tasks and that rolls up and shows as complete within project. That, my opinion, is a serious gap in capability uh, for project. And so Microsoft, of course, if you go and do a search for Microsoft support, there's this information, which I've included in multiple presentations that I've given on the topic about which tool to use when. Uh, but just remember that they're, they're, what I just showed you, the standalone capabilities. And here, this is back in October 2017. Um, for that portfolio view in Project Online, there is this, this idea of a portfolio view. So there is more that you can do, and this is within the, with the Agile or Scrum capability uh, within Project Online. So you can actually go and set up, again, this is separate from Planner, but it would seem to be a logical place to have an integration, and I don't have any news there, between the, uh, the Agile methodology, this, this Kanban uh, model in Project Online with Planner, but that is not there today. They are separate. You can export, you can create that soft link as it, they show here, um, that, you know, over to a plan, but there is no continuity between the two. And that's all that I wanted to share about that. So well, it seems, just, like it, to yeah. me, seems like to me, it's just like, you know, it's not the only instance of uh, continuity between the apps. I mean, if you take a look at it, I mean, uh, having the, the cotton bond between planner and, and teams and tasks, I mean, you can have t you can have those tiles, you know, and then not being able to integrate the three together, but not even be able to integrate them into Power BI or anything like that. Right. So there's a yeah, lot of I've, activity that has to happen. It would be it would be great to be able to. I think what this uh, one person on my blog was saying, you know, what that he wants, 
is if I've got my, even if I had, uh, even if there's not a direct relation between the two, like I finish all the tasks here, the PM still needs to go manually update them in project, mm -hmm. MS project. It would be great if it had a relationship and when you complete it in one place, it's completed there. That's one of the benefits of, of using planner for a lot of this, uh, for the task management is because if I'm assigned a task that might be part of a plan, a board that I never go into, but when I mark it as complete, that rolls up. I just yeah. want it to roll all the way up to that portfolio view. But what would be a great in between, and Mike, I think this this kind of addresses what you mentioned. If if, if I have a plan in Planner, and I want to take one task or a couple tasks and blow that out to a sub plan, yeah, I would like that to roll up. So then I could have across multiple channels, even across multiple teams, I could have uh, uh, you know these multiple plans and or boards. And, but I can go up and I can create that portfolio view from one location and it maintains the relationships yeah. with the sub, sub boards. So again, folks, that doesn't exist today. Uh, <laughs> it kind of shines a wish spotlight list. on the two disparate data models and well, lack of interactivity between the two. So yeah, it, it, and, and so this is one of those complaints when I say that I've been providing this feedback back to Microsoft. So back in 2001, um, I started working with one of the first uh, SaaS solutions for project management. So I worked with a company called Project Arena, and I think they've been resold, and I'm not sure names have been away from the space for a long time. But there were multiple solutions that were out there that were non-Microsoft, you know, of course, but did this, had that portfolio view. Because, uh, I mean, this goes back into, I, I maintain portfolio views, you know, uh, in, in spreadsheets, created them all manually, um, you know, back into the mid nineties. And so it's not a new problem. And uh, so I've been, it's a reason why, one of the primary reasons why I attempted to deploy project server back in 2005, which included a deployment of SharePoint, which is how I got into the SharePoint space. So anyway, hmm. all right. So there's uh, there's project activities. What else is going on? Any any uh, other questions that you guys have seen from the community over the last week? You know, a lot of questions, uh, obviously from from a uh, community standpoint, uh, are around you know virtual conferences. Not from a, you know in not a product point of view, but just going virtual with Ignite and things like that. I actually had an interesting conversation on a, um, a happy hour. Uh, you know, that's that's a that's a thing to do nowadays is to have have these virtual happy hours. You know, because you can't get together anymore. Yeah. So uh, they've been asking a lot of questions about uh, Ignite and how how that's going to work with you know fourteen seventeen thousand people all getting together and uh, trying to use Teams. <laughs> trying to use Teams. Um, or uh, that that type of scale, yeah. Yeah, and the so we, I know that was brought up with the discussion around Inspire um, being the first event where I've not seen any news on it um, yet, but um, I know that there's been some with with groups of MVPs, you, per, you know, some community folks providing feedback back to Microsoft on what we'd like to see. Anna Chu provided uh, it did a tweet jam a yeah. week ago. I think like a little over a week ago where she was looking for feedback specifically around Ignite. I wasn't able to participate. I had another session going on. Um, but the missing link uh, is that the, the personal connection that, you know, you, you can't, I think the, one of the benefits of Inspire and Ignite, it's not the content. There's some great content. There's announcements that will be made. You can still dial into keynotes but it's being able to walk over and talk to somebody at the product team booth. It's the, the, the vendor booths to go investigate other solutions, to see community sessions and then sit and talk with people and the, the connections that are made. And how do you replicate that? We need a Tinder app or we need second life inside <laughs> of teams. Swipe, <laughs> swipe, 
<laughs> that, <laughs> that is an attractive one. Life in a that's an attractive time. OneDrive MVP. I'm gonna okay. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's the hallway conversations, you know, that are that, that are the biggest miss, and it's meeting people sitting in the hang space or, you know, yep. being in front of the monitors and just kind of hanging out. Um, even going, you know, walking down the in the the hall there, where everybody just kind of goes to the community area and stuff. You just run into people, and it's people you haven't seen in years. I mean, they're people I haven't seen in like ten years. It all of a sudden, like, holy cow! But you know, when it comes down to it, it's it's not only that, but it's it's the sense of of not being involved. You know, some of the folks are saying that they they really don't make a contact um, a connection, I should say, with. Uh, being involved in the event and they've got to, you know, hop into a session here and schedule and move around and, you know, jump around and sometimes you get called away. It's not like, it's not like actually being at the event where you kind of dedicate yourself to the event. Um, and, you know, they, it, it, it's, it's, it's becoming a, a different way of thinking, a different uh, way of, of, you know, uh, of doing things for folks and they're, they're having a hard time adjusting to it. Yeah, no dim type fun. What was that, Al? I said no dim type fun. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, if, if, when you think about the, the amount of time that you spend um, just sitting in sessions, I mean, a lot of folks don't even go to sessions anymore because they, they're recorded, right? So a lot of them are just, it's all about networking, it's all about the community. I spent. Yeah. I used Absolutely. to be the first time that I went um, to Ignite uh, when it was Tech Ed, obviously, um, that was like, I filled my schedule. I mean, from the beginning of the day down till, you know, nine o'clock at night. And then it was all drinking time after that. And that was for, you know, three, four days straight. Now, when I go, I'm lucky if I have three or four sessions and it's just because it's it, I'm involved in so many other things. There's so many other things that I want to do um, and talk to people and go to other places like other hotels where they have other meetings and they have all this other kind of stuff going on. So uh, it's, it's really, it's different. So there, the last uh, 2019, it was 75% networking and 25% uh, meetings are, let's say sessions. Well, and, and obviously there's, uh, you know, for, for the, the five of us are, are all MVPs. And, and so we have, you know, uh, regular uh, meetings. Um, they seem to have increased for some reason, um, yeah. but where we have at least monthly calls with MVPs where we're getting previews, we're talking about the new features as we're getting closer to a major event or major announcements. Some of those may increase in frequency. We're, we're seeing a, a lot more uh, meetings you know, MVP calls on specific product areas. And so we might have four or five calls in a month, every month leading up to that. So obviously for us going to these, these events, the content that's being presented might be less valuable than the networking. We're not, you know, trying to, uh, to say that the content's not important, especially, oh, absolutely not. You know, absolutely. having those, those sessions, but you're to your point though, Mike, is that, it's easier to consume that. Great example uh, is that because an event that's global like Ignite or Inspire or Build that's coming up uh, the, the soonest uh, is a global event. They have to repeat sessions. The benefit is that if you're physically there, there's only so many sessions you can go in and participate in. When you're having the duplicate sessions in the same day, they'll do them early in the day for uh, EMEA in North America, and then late into the evening for APAC, it means that uh, like during the MVP summit where they did this, I was able to consume twice. It's, it's not like I just went to the same number of sessions spread over, the, over that day. I was doing eight, nine, 10 hours of content each day uh, because there was so much more that I could consume. So I would, like I'm passionate about uh, the, certainly the project side of things as well as the collaboration, the SharePoint team stuff. Um, but I was able to sit in a ton of stuff around um, Azure, start to participate in more of the dynamic stuff. And so things that I just wouldn't be able to do physically. And, and so that, that's a huge benefit. 
but there, I think is what we're, we're all agreed. I mean, there's, there's figuring out a way to get people to uh, do these ad hoc connections is going to be critical to, I think, the long-term success of doing these virtually. One of the questions that came up was uh, during the, the conversation was, you know, how do I prepare to do this? And I'm like, well, that was really easy to do when we were going in person because people would tell you what, how to pack, you know, where to go, what kind of transportation to use, you know, how to get from the airport to the conference center and, and uh, where the best places to eat are uh, and the best places to hang out, so on and so forth. Um, but now it's like, how do you do this virtually? <laughs> you know, some folks are like, are we going to get a content catalog? Are we going to go through that? Yeah, and I'm sure that's all going to happen, but it's just, it's kind of the unknown right now. Any other topics, anything else? I think besides uh, get some uh, people that are, as, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, that are complaining that we're using Zoom for the live stream. <laughs> Folks, if you do any kind of webinars, if you're familiar with, with web meetings and all these technologies, you know that what teams can't do yeah. is live streaming, what we're doing here. Uh, and that's why we're using the technology. Yeah, we're, uh, we are talking about moving over and adding a, a different third party solution to be able to live stream and set up with OBS, for example, uh, that'll allow us to simulcast on multiple streams and then do things versus teams. But uh, yeah, the Teams live events, again, doesn't live stream. It is a webinar, it will broadcast. So then you'll still then have to uh, live stream it using a third party solution. And so we've simplified this. We're using one tool rather than having to run Teams and uh, another third party solution, which has its inherent problems. Um, and if you've run any of those, and I've participated in some, and the technical glitches that happen, where this just works for us. So you, you need, need to put this? up a sign in the corner of your screen that says something like this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you just flash that every once in a while. Oh, right, Sean. <laughs> so yeah. let me ask this: This is. Are there any other uh, of you that uh, um, are? have heard about this is that a lot of the live streamers now obviously the facebook is a problem christian you and i are in agreement on that i'm, I'm totally anti-facebook um but it's if some people are going to twitch right so yeah. my son my son is broadcasting on twitch i thought it was an all gamer type of thing but uh there are quite a few technology streams out there on yep. twitch now yep. uh so that that's kind of interesting yeah and there's uh, yeah, and, and there's a restream, of course, and, you know, and, and so we've talked about that, uh, of, you know, whether we uh, broadcast and just share it via Twitter versus YouTube. And the problem with both of those places is that there's not a standing community, like a, a room where we could go and simulcast to. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, it's like Facebook is the place where uh, all of the, the whiners about Zoom are complaining about it on there. It's like, but the reality is they that keep your audience there, Christian. Yeah. Well, just <laughs> look, I mean, Hey, the, the people that are whining, the, those people that are whining about us using zoom, they're also not asking any questions. So oh, yeah. okay. uh, they're, they're just the haters going to hate haters going to hate. <laughs> exactly. And uh, in the meantime, people that uh, actually have questions, uh, who cares what platform it's on? You got a question, ask the question. Yeah. We're making ourselves available. Ask your questions. I think Hal had something now. Oh, I was just going to say that's uh, what the Society of Broadcast Engineers has selected on for their monthly webinars is Twitch. Um, the interface, not all that much different than this one, all that just considered. Um, it's, it's kind of the same, but different. Uh, it also has uh, moderated capabilities and, of course, questions and answers and things like that. It's... It's interesting that you bring that up, though, because my first acquaintance with it was just a couple of months ago when these uh, Society of Broadcast Engineers where the webinars started up. And alternatively, there are some pretty good game streams out there. Yeah. Are you guys gamers? Oh, yeah, big time. Yeah. I don't game at all. I mean, <laughs> it's like, it's like everybody looks at me. That's a, that's a nerd. And they're like, you don't game. I'm like, 
No. <laughs> Mike, you're out. You're out. Time to game. You guys are out. Yeah. <laughs> cut them, Christian. Custom. Well, cut them. I, I, yeah, I just I, I look. At, I, it was a it was a, a very important part of my uh, my childhood, especially you know junior high was. You know, my my dad. Uh, in fact, this is a strong memory, a positive memory with my dad was uh, some Saturday picking up my my buddy on the way, and we had kind of saved up our quarters and went down to the arcade, and, oh, and yeah. uh, so like an hour and a half into it, burned through my stash, went over, and it was like, you know, well, my dad's not going to show up to pick us up for like another hour, and I'm walking around looking at the games, and there's my dad, <laughs> <laughs> never left. <laughs> well, hey, you throw you throw an asteroids or a centipede in front of me, uh, you know I'm all over that. But when you start getting into this role player stuff, I mean, I'm watching my son play Fortnite. I actually get a little motion sickness, you know, yeah. just just from the, the the first person thing. And it, and to me, it's all about it's all about blowing people away. It's all about, you know, it's it's kind of crazy when you when you, Is this you know, still a family and, channel. Oh, but, <laughs> actually enjoy i actually enjoy my you know like i actually, said i enjoy I, playing I, I enjoy away. minecraft really <laughs> yeah, yeah, minecraft's really, awesome really, 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 really. well you know it's a so you know, sean and i have many conversations and see each other online i mean there are certain things where yeah most of them like i just i can't get into some of those those games however uh, you know there's certain ones like i'm a huge uh, tf2 team fortress 2 yeah, team fortress. I, I love team fortress 2 um and then i play uh, the Lord of the Rings games because I'm a massive oh, okay. Lord of the Rings guy, and so the uh, Shadow of War, the latest one, is I mean, I just I played it last night for about 45 minutes. Um, so it's a you know if I've got I'm taking a break, want to go and just kind of uh, let the mind uh, relax from the work activities or whatever else is going on, to go and uh, kill a few hundred orcs. <laughs> I can verify this in the middle of the day. Yeah, I'll see my little Steam uh, contacts thing pop up. up, and there's Christian. Yep, so that's what I, I'll do. Is uh, I you know two or moose wiggle walking? Yep, walking the dogs or uh, or going on and the and I love TF2. If you've not seen it, because the designers, I think that the the creator, the designer of the characters was the same guy who created the Incredibles. Oh. It's a very distinctive art style. Course, yeah, so they all look like they're characters from Incredibles. It's it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So maybe I should maybe I should try that out a little bit more. Give it a, give it give it another shot because I was just like I just didn't get into it that much. But uh, um, there's, yeah, there's some very funny uh, videos on YouTube promo videos for each of the character types, like the heavy and um, the scout and the the other character types in TF2. Pretty funny. I try that. What, what is Han, Hans? What are you doing? <laughs> I guess we're getting a tour of Hans's yeah. house. Yeah. Just, Hans, don't go in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, turn it off. Uh, you can see that. <laughs> oh. Uh, oh, somebody, uh, uh, so Wasif is asking, hey, can we do a live translation on chat in Teams? Like if he's, if he's speaking to somebody who's, talk to somebody on Teams who's speaking French, um, can it do a live translation no. to no. English? No. no. Yeah. yeah. No, not yet, but if you're doing a, present, a PowerPoint presentation with Teams, you can set PowerPoint up to do that. Talk about uh, Teams as that um, it is on the roadmap. And, uh, you know, they, they talked about that uh, a little bit um, during the Teams call that they have every, every other week. Um, and uh, they said that, that it's something that they're going to do. Um, they're just taking the AI that they use for the PowerPoint and moving it over to Teams. Yeah. It's a chat a no portion. Brainer. Yeah, it's a textual chat. You know, it's not the spoken word because they're focusing more on the spoken word than actual, you know, converting text. Um, so you can get, you can get translator to do that text conversion for you, um, in another window, but if you want it, you know, the spoken word, then it's, uh, you know, it's, they got to use AI for that. So there was the, uh, Microsoft translator in a few years back, um, yeah. I, so I, what the way that you can do that again, it's not within teams, um, but 
uh, where I was actually able to do this in real time and the translation was pretty decent, but I had to have the Microsoft translator open on that, yep. that, that site and the camera on me. And so I had some Spanish speakers that were sitting there with headphones watching through the translator uh, app on their laptop. And as it was capturing my audio, it was doing some of the translation. Okay, right. I don't speak fluent Spanish. I, I wasn't behind looking at the accuracy of that. Um, but they followed along. They stayed in my session the entire hour. And, uh, you know. That's saying something. Right. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. You sure they weren't sleeping? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what? Sean, what? <laughs> <laughs> but you think about it, the chat part, I mean, that's any participant, right? So, and, and it's coming over in text. It's not something that you'd have to have like an API that reads, you know, that, that chat window. Um, and I'm sure Teams, it's, maybe it's a, you know, a private API, um, but. It's a tie into Azure translation services. I believe so. Cognitive services? Um, one of them, whether it's speech or text, oh, audio okay. or text. Okay. I may be misspoken on that. And if somebody knows for sure, uh, feel free to correct me, but I think that's what it is. Especially with all the stuff that we have to do remote now, it's definitely be a benefit because, you know, a lot of the conversation happens in this chat and, uh, Lord knows yeah. if you're in teens and you come in as a guest then you can't see the chat. Right. Um, you know, which is. For any teams people out there, it's lame. <laughs> <laughs> Those poor folks. I, I, they've been beat on for years. I know when we had the, uh, the, of course, there's two different pains in particular around that with teams. There's the switching into the staying with the same identity, but switching into a, a different tenant. And then there's the changing identities, logging out and log back in. But I know some of those problems exist because I go back and forth between anonymous with a different account and whatnot. Um, if you switch into the tenant, if you go up and you have that available, like for instance, whenever Microsoft's doing a call, if I'm actually in a, another tenant at the time, regardless of who I'm signed in as, um, I won't see the chat dialogue and chat options. But if I switch into that tenant from Microsoft, they'll pop up. So and that, that was pretty apparent during the MVP summit, uh, you know, depending on what you came yep. in. But, you know, and but they, they prioritize, right? So, you know, right. virtual backgrounds, virtual backgrounds had to be there first. <laughs> Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah. <laughs> now they have virtual, they have videos. They have virtual videos you can put in the, in the background. No, that's for Zoom. I don't think you can do that in Teams. Teams is just images. No, yeah. You can do it with Teams if you splice in with, uh, for instance, the uh, XSplit, which um, is oh. one of the tools that uh, webcasters will typically use, particularly gamers. You can splice into video feeds. And I know that uh, Vesa has been doing that with him, walking back to get his water bottle for the 150th yeah. time. Uh, yeah. But that's XSplit. You've seen some examples of that. I like the my favorite one is the you know, just for the longest time it's just like the door to his office, and then suddenly the door opens and he walks into his own meeting and kind of like oh oh sorry and goes back out, <laughs> and then has that on a long loop. That's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw I saw one where it's actually a person sitting there, and it's the whole you know thirty minutes of the person looking at screens and moving around and and being on mute, and then all of a sudden. They walk into the room. So they're sitting there on the screen and walk into the room and they sit down and they're in perfect frame right with the video. <laughs> yeah. Lots of devious things you'd be able to do with that <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. Were yeah. you at the meeting? Were you not at the meeting? Who knows? I heard about some some uh, schools are in, uh, happening that my, my wife actually showed me a, a, a post that went viral about a 10 year old girl that uh, had created a video of herself sitting in her classroom or online classroom. That's and she fantastic. Wasn't there. <laughs> yeah. She was out playing with the dog or something. And her mom asked her, you know, what are you supposed to be in your class? And she's like, well, I just recorded a video of myself and I'm playing the video. <laughs> she's 10 years you old. Fangled technology. <laughs> Gosh, darn it. Yeah. A lot, lot of comments over in the uh, in the watch party about uh, streaming still and 
Uh, and yeah, it, I know it's confusing. Some folks that say, what are you talking about? Teams will stream. Like, no, Teams will post a recording or a webinar over to stream, Microsoft stream, which is not a live stream to, uh, uh, I don't know, Fred, that's not what you're saying with the, what you just shared, but it's a. And I heard, I heard they're actually putting a watermark on there now. So Teams, when you actually create a video, will throw a watermark in the beginning. Oh, wow, and nasty. I know. I'm like, why? I mean, come Isn't on. it just for like the first five seconds though? Yeah. Yeah. So we were recording. And now, you know, <laughs> yeah, we were recording a team session uh, for the uh, Dutch PowerShell group and the Dutch PowerShell group. They actually say when they're getting ready to record, they say, okay, just stand by and every, you know, the speaker, please, you know, uh, freeze for five seconds and don't say anything because they edit out the watermark. <laughs> Uh, Magnus makes it raises a great point. He just commented, says, "I'm gaming." Says, "I'm helping an association here in Sweden to develop their summer camp in Minecraft uh, EDU." Oh, cool! Uh, and the kids love it. They're building the campgrounds and surrounding, so it's an excellent project planning tool with powerful help for visualizations. You know, honestly, I think with a, a lot of the, um, you know, when they announced like the SharePoint Spaces and some of the earlier, you know, versions of the, the VR and even a AR capabilities we're just very rudimentary and far behind where a lot of the gaming platforms oh, sure. you know, already were. And, and so it's a fantastic learning tool. Yeah. So that's yeah. a, that's a great spaces comment. is coming along pretty nicely. I mean, they are in continuing to add features to it semi-regularly, but um, I don't know ultimately what that is going to end up doing. I, I'm in the preview for that. So. Yeah, no, a, a few people were excited about um, SharePoint conference. Uh, I, I don't know that they were going to, what, if they're going to announce something at Build or SPC around that space, I expect to see a few things uh, for Ignite. So I'm not sure what's in the, the roadmap for Build. So um, yeah, I'd be watching for that. But I, I know that they're going to be sharing more info on what's happening with spaces this year. Yeah, it's continuing to bake out. Yeah, very cool. Any other questions? Any other stuff uh, that that uh, you gentlemen have seen from the community questions that we can discuss here? Bring up whether through your social channels or blogs or related. And any I'll questions from those that are watching the live stream that uh, that we can answer for you? Besides. Well, there's, I will say there's been, you know, I don't know if anybody uh, out there really works with uh, Azure with the MFA. Um, you know, they made a big change uh, recently. They released earlier this uh, last week was around the ability. We have a multi-factor authentication, um, the ability now to do multi-factor authentication and self-service uh, password reset. And the users can do that now. It used to be an admin thing. Um, and, but now you have a lot more flexibility with that. One of the biggest complaints I had with larger organizations was we don't want to manage this. We want the users to manage that. And uh, that's always been kind of a tripping point uh, with the multi-factor. So uh, it, that, was a, that was kind of a big thing. Yeah, I was just looking for a link to... Um, I tweeted it last week. Uh, let me... Can you post it in the chat here. I'll share it out to share. Facebook. Awesome. Yeah. And if there's, uh, yeah, Sean, are you able to grab anything for, for those that might be interested on SharePoint Spaces? Just a link that you can also share. Um. Yeah. Let me see what I can pull up. Yeah, if there's any, just share it up in the in the chat, and I'll post it out to the uh, Facebook live stream. Oh, and the other thing, yeah, GitHub is free for Teams. Yay! Oh, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> <coughs> totally awesome. That was big news. Yeah, I tweeted that stuff out when I saw those announcements go through. Yeah. No. Yeah, if you're, uh, I'll share that link out as well.
And somebody just posted a question. It says, what are your thoughts on cloud voicemail? Uh, Microsoft replaced unified messaging, but there doesn't seem to have enough documentation about it. Cloud voicemail is in a, the PBX they offer with the E5. Is that what we were talking about? The E5 subscription with Office 365, you get the PBX in the cloud? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, the PBX in the cloud is only for E5 subscriptions. So if that's actually what they're talking about, I mean, that's just a, a virtual PBX, like a 3C or whatever, you know, or uh, up in the cloud that allows for voicemails. I, I don't know I mean, if I don't understand the question correctly. Uh, yeah, so uh, Wasif is saying, responding yes, but. I just posted a link. Uh, this one's from Stefan Bauer. Um, it was towards the tail end of last year, but uh, SharePoint supports uh, 3D model previews now. And that's something that's tied to spaces. All right, pasting that in to the chat as well. Spaces uh, team and teams for the preview is active, but there's not a lot of, you're not gonna see posts every day. They kind of come in fits and spurts as different things come out and different announcements are made. I forgot. <laughs> Uh, I just saw my little note and reminder of some things to bring. <laughs> I forgot I was going to start things off by commenting about how I was going to complain about not being out, able to get out and get Erica. Not a problem for the rest of the group this morning. <laughs> uh, Join the club, Christian. <laughs> Come to the dark side. We have quicker showers. <laughs> uh, yeah, good times. Uh, all right. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. So seriously, any other questions? Hans, what's happening in your world? What's What's new in the news of the of Mister? If those that don't know Hans, based in Germany, Mister OneDrive. What's new in the OneDrive world? Oh, I'm working on a bot, and a bot with two other MVPs from Austria, and uh, they want to digitize me before I arrive. So I have to do all my knowledge about OneDrive. And you know, if I start, I never end. That means if you say hello, that comes a large sentence, but uh, it's, it's a horrible story because the tools of Microsoft uh, in this stuff is not well prepared. We have to wait a little bit. So I have now 500 questions and I have to decide, hey, that's other question. This bot is running first in Teams. So in Teams, you have user. And the last 10 years, I only have to speak with, uh, spoken with IT people. So the questions, I have to do it in a very new thing because these people, the user, have other questions with OneDrive than I normally have and answer it. So that's the difference. And yes, it, it will come more and more with this stuff. Uh, means now you have the possibility with OneDrive to go to your Explorer and see the version history there. So I say the Windows Explorer is coming down and it's a represent, representation layer about the SharePoint libraries. And that it's a good thing, but it takes a little bit more time. And then you can search and all this stuff and, and you have, although you do not have to go to a browser. And that's, that's for me, Many, many people see, hey, I want to do it with a word. I want to do it uh, with a browser, not with the browser, with a, uh, the Windows Explorer, and I do not want to switch. And therefore, for these people, it's, it's, a, it's a good story that will come up. Opening a browser is a pain. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Can I ask you a question uh, uh, that came up? Um, it's kind of been a pain for me is, is the sharing in OneDrive. So the ability to actually share a direct link, you know, it's always been kind of a pain. A dozen of, clicks required? Yeah, the number of clicks required compared to other services that, that, are, uh, that offer that, but also a direct link to the file because you always get a, a link to that opens up, it'll open up a browser and you get to the folder view, 
but you can it, it's not actually a direct download of a file no, the, the question is, uh, you have to see the story about sharing is a little bit complicated. So in my, I, I give a lot of presentations and in this slide deck, so eight hour slide deck, only about one drive, um, there are 100 slides about sharing. It's not mm -hmm. easy and Microsoft is changing the world and will do that. And sometimes they share some information and I say, it's easier for you, yes. But you have to know several times, let's say for external sharing, because we cannot share. Sometimes the people are not allowed. So that's the, 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 the story. It's, it's great. And that means the, the story about behind the scene, the security story is not so easy to understand and to translate. So I do a lot of things and that's although what can be happen. It could be, yes. And Therefore, it's not so easy to say, yes, it's easy. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit complicated. Yeah, and I, I, I'm just comparing it to, I mean, obviously like Dropbox or Box or something like that, where it's, it's a little bit easier to do an anonymous type of, of share that just gives you direct access to the file. You can't really do that in, in OneDrive. Um, you know, you have to have some kind of permission on that file. So it, yes. it's, it's, a, it's a little different. And it, I think it's got something to do also maybe with the, 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 uh, the SharePoint roots, you know, uh, going back. Yeah, because the layer is between that, because the layer between the stuff is SharePoint. And therefore you have to, to look for the rights in there. And at the beginning, that was easy. Now they'll say, okay, we want to have it easy. If I share it with you over an external link, you can close it. It could be automatically close the stuff. That means, yes, I shared it for you. Three months on less than 90 days. They have to do it in a different ways. Uh, uh, an enterprise company has to say, we want to have it more. So now you can have it 730 days. That means two years. But anyway, if you started and have to say, yes, 90 days or 14 days, the link will automatically be closed. And that's the best thing what we can do. But sometimes the people have to say, the administrators in this stuff have to say, we want to do it first. We want, no, no external link. So if I say, so today I was a question in the morning. Um, he says, okay, I want request the files, but the link will not show up. What do I run? It's not run because you must be able to open for external. And if the admins has to say no external, you cannot have request the files. But we request the files and Tony Redmond, uh, although, uh, said it very clearly, you can request the files if you are available, but the problem is I can give you also an exe file with virus and so on, not the, this virus, we now have all these days, but I can show it all inside because I have no control there. And I asked also the, 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 the broker, broken group from, from OneDrive, why do you do not have all the time? The time is in there, the standard time. But uh, we do not want to do it uh, in this way. And I say, yes, you can do it in a, in a different way. But there are only, most of the time, there are only two visits, easy for the user and also the security stuff. And that's not so easy to, to, to share it. It reminds me a lot of... Uh... Uh, file Explorer view on top of SharePoint document libraries. Oh, yeah. Conceptually very simple, but when you get into the layer upon layer of web dev on top of that, along with the IIS extensions and everything that falls, once everything finally goes through, it's anything but simple. It's like, why is performance so bad? Well, when you've got to traverse three or four logical layers to actually get down to uh, the other side, it it gets very busy very quick, and what Hans is saying sounds very reminiscent of that. I have to say there's Sometimes. scenarios like this where it, it, there's a reason why some of these other third-party solutions, these cloud storage solutions, may still have very you know uh, robust sales pipelines. And, and, and we want to have a fully integrated solution, and it's great to have for, the, for my needs – uh, you know, OneDrive more than meets the, the needs for that. But, you know, for a lot of these special cases, especially when you're talking about, um, you, you know, these uh, the old the file shares and organizations that have built very complex scenarios and integrations, customizations off of 
their file shares. It's not so easy as, hey, let's just go and move it across and integrate with, with OneDrive. And there's valid use cases for having some of these other solutions that are out and there. Been, and that's been a sticking point with some of the, the I'm, I apologize, Hans. Uh, the sticking point is around, um, for years, has been around SFTP. So you, you haven't been able to do an SFTP even in the Azure services. And that's always been something that the, the folks that run Azure files have just been hammered on this um, in terms of why can't we have SFTP? And I've got, I've got enterprises that are saying, hey, we just want one solution where we can manage files. Okay, we don't want multiple solutions. So if you give me one solution that you can do all of these things um, instead of, you know, having, well, and you shake your head, no, Hans, but there's a third party out there that's got that, you know, is close to that. I mean, when you take a look at Box, they're no slouch, and they do have that external capability, and they do have that SFTP capability. So it's, you know, if you have, if you want to incorporate that all, if they're going to focus all their money on files, Azure files, um, over OneDrive or <coughs> however that priority mixes in, um, you know, it's, it's something that should be thought of. But the problem is also for enterprise, if you take uh, and ask for, for large files. So I have a company that's a construction company and the lifetime of the documents they have is about 10 years. They're started with 10,000 documents. They're started. And at the end of the 10 years, they have 600,000 documents. And that's not handled back. You have to stop it to 300,000 files. And I asked the product group and uh, they say, no way this time. So for enterprise and large document, there are, that's a different one. You have enterprise companies with many, many users and small portions, that's okay. But if you have a big thing and only small people, let's say 100, 120 people, then you can all trouble because of so many files, folder thief and so on. And that it's a little bit struggling. Hans, I've got a question. What does the height yeah. of the people using the technology have to do with anything? Small people. You just go constantly talking about small people. I don't think that it. <laughs> because they're small. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. But I guess it, that's my way oh, to transition small. into the uh, the end of this uh, this session. But, uh, oh, Christian. <laughs> Uh, so oh, I'll just, uh, well, that just tells me something about Hans and his prejudice against short people. So, <laughs> and on that <laughs> note, <laughs> yeah. well, Hey, well, thank you gentlemen for, uh, for joining this session. Uh, thanks for everybody that's watching, been watching the live streams, uh, out on Facebook and, uh, we'll, of course I'll post this stuff out to, uh, YouTube here, uh, today. We've got a few, the, the back recordings going up today as well. Uh, with some guidance, uh, you know, links to be able to jump to the points of the conversation where we're talking about each of the different problem areas. So uh, we'll be back uh, next week. Everybody here is invited to join. It's every Monday, same time, same hour. And of course, uh, for those that are really gluttons for punishment and want to complain about us using Zoom for live streaming, we'll be back this evening <laughs> at uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, where we'll be uh, connecting with folks from if the Facebook API works this week. And uh, if Christian's failed. ability to click a button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's that as well to, to officially start things, but uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be doing that again this evening. So uh, thanks everybody for joining. All right. Take care you. everyone. Thanks. Bye. A lot of experience and I will defer to Sean there on uh, what it is they're actually looking for. But what I'm kind of myself hoping to do is to bring some old computer science to new computer scientists. Uh, there's an awful lot of stuff that's happened over the last 20 years that uh, computers are still computers. They kind of program the same way. The language has changed, but, uh, but uh, not how they work. So uh, it, uh, I, I think it would be kind of fun if, uh, if there's any interest in that sort of thing to provide a little history for those of us who started out on the TRS-80 Model 1. Yeah, I had a trash 80 color computer myself. Um, I got three of them. Do you? A one, yeah, I, two, and a three. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, actually, I learned um, assembly programming on a 6502 processor. The um, Commodore 64 and the Apple IIe both had 6502s from Motorola. 
Um, and that's where I got my kind of kick start, if you will. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I want to give this to uh, as much as I can to youth and get the next generation into the uh, computer science programs of the future and marshal them along. Yeah, did would be cool. I mean, when I first got into computers, my first experience with that, with the world of computers was as a freshman at the University of Arizona in 19, let's see, it would have been the fall of 1968. I had just, uh, just graduated high school and that's where I was going at. A I was almost alive there, Hal. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, what can I tell you? <laughs> any event, part of any being a, an electrical engineering student, which is what I was up there to try to learn, was computer programming. In this case, it was Fortran 4. And uh, I don't know if any of you have had any experiences with it, but that's probably the one I, of the most. I am a big fan of. of languages I've ever seen. I'm a big fan of Fortran 5, the band. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've actually got some of their stuff. I do too. Uh, but I never learned Fortran. I learned Pascal. Um, that was useful. Uh, I did learn COBOL. Um, oh, wow. Oh. I, you're in demand. Oh, brother. Well, that was back in eight, eighth grade. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like riding a bicycle, you know. Some of those skills might carry over. Oh, God. You hey. know... Yeah. Ugh. Go ahead, yeah. Christian. I, I was just going to say that uh, there's a question I want to pose, ask both of you your thoughts on this. It was posted over to the Office 365 community on Facebook. Um, somebody asked, what level of IT knowledge is needed before starting with Office 365? And he meant as like an IT is an admin IT pro, but, you know, kind of where to go for broad knowledge. And so there's, uh, well, give, give your guys uh, your, your thoughts. If somebody comes to you with that, broad question, where do you direct them? How should people get started with their IT pro training? Um, you want to take that how first or I can do it? Uh, no, you go. Ahead. Okay. Well, I, I have a bit of a different perspective than you. So, uh, well, well, that's why it's, it's good to have, I think each of our perspectives, I'll share my thoughts as well. So Sean, why don't you start us? Well, if somebody's going to become an IT admin, um, with cloud services, um, a good understanding of networking fundamentals is important. Uh, networking security, uh, firewalls, that sort of stuff. That's kind of a baseline for just being able to uh, do things properly and safely and correctly, securely. Um, but I mean, that's kind of one entry point, I think. Yeah. Well, from my, my standpoint, I, I got into the Office 365 game kind of a long time before it was Office 365. You had Outlook and Word and Excel and so forth, and they were all pretty much standalone services. And uh, that was, then along came the Exchange server. And that's, I think, the idea where he might be looking at when you start looking at the back end rather than the front end applications. Um, and I did an awful lot of reading for that, that uh, for, for Exchange and, 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 and Windows Server and so forth. I just found myself a bunch of news groups and started reading questions and answers. A lot of them didn't make a whole lot of sense, but I kept track of what it was, what I was learning, what they were saying. And when the opportunity arose to actually install the software, and again, this is before cloud, uh, so take that for what it's worth, but nevertheless, uh, at, at that stage, having done all that reading and all that studying and so forth, once I got got the, uh, the software itself, then the bits and pieces started to make sense because I'd already seen the words, I had a clue what the words meant, how, they, how the various pieces sort of interacted with each other, even though I couldn't visualize it once. Once I got the product, then it started to fall in place. So from that standpoint, hanging out at places like docs.microsoft.com, another thought, get yourself a, uh, of a, uh, uh, an E3 or so such sub subscription, something that gives you the ability to get into the admin area and uh, just start playing. That's 
kind of how yeah. I get them. Yeah. Um, additionally, what you learn from an on-premises standpoint uh, doesn't change in the cloud. Uh, you still need a, a working knowledge of Azure Active, uh, Active Directory, and that carries over into Azure Active Directory. Mm -hmm. Uh, you learn about all the different uh, configurations and hybrid configurations, in particular you can have yourself set up in, um, you know, how to use things like Azure Active Directory Connect, uh, AAD Connect to link um, your AD, uh, your directory on-prem to the cloud. You might only go, you might go cloud only. There are a variety of different ways to do it. And so, you know, much of what Hal is saying is, I, I agree with um, the docs are a good place. Uh, look at some of the courseware um, that Microsoft lays out, and I believe a lot of it's available for free. You can get a lot of that training with through Microsoft, um, and it's a good place to start. Yeah, the one that I yeah, there. I mean, I, yeah, there's great training stuff that's available through uh, through Linda through so L Y N D A, uh, which was acquired by. LinkedIn, there's courseware that's, of course, that's paid out on Pluralsight. Um, but the one, the place that I commented uh, out in Facebook and to answer, um, I highly recommend um, that folks pick up, if you're going to be an admin of Office 365, uh, the book by uh, Tony Redmond and a bunch of other co-authors, but Tony, the lead author, the Office 365 for IT Pros. I mean, it's the comprehensive guide to Microsoft's cloud office system and the latest update. So you pay for it once it's, it's uh, 39 95 and you get every update f forever after that. Uh, the latest update was the 14th of April. So mm -hmm. he, he provides updates at least once a month. Uh, yeah, that's valuable. Changes. And so it's incredibly valuable. Go get the, yeah, I believe if you buy the print edition, you get the uh, you get the Kindle or the you get the it's, it's delivered a couple different ways for digital. Um, so you know, check it out. You can purchase it if you go look for that on uh, you know Tony's website or on Amazon or just about everywhere else. You'll be able to find it. But it's the most comprehensive and most up to date, constantly updated resource guide that I found. So yeah. And up to date is hard to get these days, yep. especially uh, with courseware and courses. Um, people sink a lot of time, but the traditional courseware cycle is kind of broken. You need to buy into something that is going to be updated frequently because Office 365, as we know, is an evergreen service, turns over regularly new features, capabilities being rolled out, and uh, somebody's got to document those, and you need a program that's going to integrate those into, into the, the base, so, yeah. All right, uh, yeah, any, uh, so I'm, I'm just looking through to see if there's any other questions. Anything either of you want to, uh, to share, questions that you have been raised that you've helped answer recently? My big push for today was teals. <laughs> That's true. How I get it, folks out there. That you've uh, blogged about or talked about lately? Um, not really. The latest thing that uh, that I've been looking at and playing with is uh, this thing. Uh, there is a, a plugin for Teams called Shifts, yeah. which is for shift workers and so forth. And uh, so I've kind of been looking about that. I'm starting to get the materials together to write a little article about it. Um, there are just so many little things like that that, uh, that, that can come up. Uh, that is not what I first thought you said, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> get your mind out of the gutter, Sean. Yes. Oh, here, here's another uh, question. Oh, yeah, this was. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear uh, both of your thoughts on this one. So it's another question from the Facebook from the 365 community. Uh, somebody was asking, they manage an Office 365 tenant and there's two partner relationships. So one is from the former MSP partner, so the, the managed service provider uh, in an advisor relation and one is from a CSP partner that's their current like service provider. 
is uh, who's trying to delete the MSP partner relationship, but it returns an error. Uh, and he's trying this as the global admin. He's unable to do that. And my response initially was, and I don't know if you have anything to add to this, was that you know, the difficulty is if that, you know, Microsoft is sensitive to um, who's defined as the partner of record. And uh, I think the only way you can get that old partner that's no longer the partner of record, if that CSP is now going to be the managing partner, is to do a service request to get on the, you know, the support call with Microsoft and to have that swapped out. It's kind of a two-stage process. They have to confirm that they're no longer the partner of record and then you have to remove it. And I don't know if either of you. I thought they were going to amend that process, though. I'm not um, sure if they have. I, I know that that's been a need for a while because you've got a lot of partners of record that, you know, do the one and done thing and walk away um, and unfortunately stay tied to those tenants. Uh, whereas, you know, a, a new vendor comes in or support person and wants to establish themselves and help the organization and get credit for it. And they don't, um, I thought. And the other side to that, of course, is that if you have somebody that comes in and they try to swap, but they've got an agreement that's in place and it's like, well, wait a second, we signed a contract and it may not be just a, Hey, get rid of us. We did this work and we provided, you know, upfront services and it's kind of, you know, front loaded on the services side and we've got a one year contract or, or what have you. So it's, uh, I can see that both ways. Yeah. But I'm not, I'm not sure if the process has changed. I'm not sure either. I'm going to do some hunting for that. I'm kind of surprised to hear that there's folks that actually work that way. The, uh, the outfit that I associate with, uh, that one, they, they, uh, a uh, client can leave pretty much at any time. There are perhaps a few days' notice, but they decide they want to leave. It's uh, they, they, it's it's at any time during a given month. They they, they sign a one-year contract, but if they want out, they leave. Yeah, um, and yeah, as this far as any records for that stuff part is, is once they're gone, uh, they're gone out out of our system too. Yeah, I I mean the honestly, I mean I heard about this two, three years ago, maybe even further back was the last time I heard this kind of a situation. And that being, you know, the issue is that there were some vendors that was like, look, we, we provided a lot of other value add. We did a bunch of consulting services and we spread out, you know, that, that cost over the term of that, that agreement. You can't just, you know, halt the agreement midway through and they were looking for that kind of protection. But um, yeah, this, uh, you know, so I, I honestly, I'm not an MSP or a CSP, so I wasn't aware if the changes what's happened uh, over the last couple of years. But sadly, that's really not something I have a lot of control over anyway, because that's <laughs> those decisions and that kind of activity is above my pay grade. Yeah. So <laughs> and that's. So what I do to try to compensate for that is, is, is fortunately the MVP program gives you an E5 license. So if I got questions and it's kind of painstaking and labor intensive, um, but I thought that questions about set up what controls who and how you, what part in the ad bill console does, does what to the tenant, uh, but I've always got that. I go in there and look. Now, mind you, that can take an awful lot of setup and trial and error, but at least it's something. Yeah, but Christian, I think you're pretty much right. They're going to have to go talk with uh, support to get that uh, rectified. Yeah, I think that's the, that was the consensus of the majority of responses. But everybody kind of said the same thing. Like, I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure you have to go and go through those steps. So you can't avoid that. But. Well, I've kind of actually got something, seen something similar to that. I uh, someone's Hotmail account was taken over uh, by uh, some nefarious person. Uh, they got access to the uh, to his uh, password and so forth. Were able to log in and get them send themselves sent up on the Authenticator app. Now he wants to close that account. I mean, he, he can go in and regain control of the account, but because the uh, 
the bad guy's got the authenticator app. He about an hour later, he gets to recon regain control. So this is actually going to have to be a case where Microsoft, because they can't, you know, due to those contractual obligations and so forth, that you just got through referencing, they really don't have a lot of, there really isn't a lot they can do. So uh, I'm kind of watching that and I'm going to see how that, that sort of plays out. It's the discussion that, that uh, has been going on on some of the, uh, the, the back end channels. And uh, uh, I really don't know what, what to say about that because you, you got on the one hand, Microsoft can't and won't without awfully, awfully, awfully compelling and good reason. And in the meanwhile, you've got a, a uh, bad guy out there masquerading as somebody and doing horn, doing nasty stuff that 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 the good guy can't can't deal with. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Definitely, <laughs> must be frustrating. Can empathize. Hey, I've got a question. <laughs> uh oh. This is from me. Now, somebody had brought, we were talking about, um, as in the conversation, I was talking about some of my, uh, so I, I think you guys both saw, so I have a, a folder on my iPhone. It's my Microsoft app graveyard. So I, I try to, like, I, I, I add every Microsoft app that comes out, and eventually some of them just get discontinued, and so there's, they, they don't go anywhere, it doesn't, they don't do anything, but I still have the icons that are on my phone. I've got a, a few that are there and others like I, with the rollout of the office app, I retired the Excel PowerPoint and word mobile apps to the graveyard, even though they still work. And uh, there was some question of whether they had more functionality or not, but I'm like, well, I never use the, those things. Uh, you know, office app I've been using, but anyway, um, but part of that question we were, uh, so a friend of mine, we were talking about, um, other apps that we just weren't sure what happened. Uh, and he was asking about um, like why Visio never, it was not been rolled into the broader office suite as a state yeah, license. Yeah, I remember the conversation. And then also asked whether access was still a thing out there. And I was like, honestly, I've not heard much about it. Do we, uh, either of you know the status of access? Yeah. Do not. Standpoint of, of, uh, well, I, whether it's an online or not at this stage of the game, at least they continue to update it as part of the office package. And uh, there is quite an active, a couple of active groups that I've, uh, that I have access to that are still going strong with it. It's, uh, and I would really hate to see that go away. I mean, I've, uh, I've used that. I had to use it extensively five or six or seven years ago for a, uh, uh repeater owners database for the ham radio community and uh, stuff that you can do with that is, is just really oh yeah is this is it gonna say that it's not shocking to me at all that the ham radio community is using <laughs> <laughs> well it's i'm just saying <laughs> there's a long story attached to that which i uh, which i may get into at some point uh, well, it's, uh, you know, I, I used to say, but, but so this was, you know, wow, back in the, uh, you know, 2010 to 2014, sometime in there, um, when, when the talk was around uh, the updated, the latest access services in the SharePoint space. Uh, and one of the things, because at that time, it was still a real push to try and migrate, uh, you know, clients that were using Lotus Notes over to, uh, you know, the, the, you know, exchange Locust notes. Right. And, uh, and, and of course, if you've ever worked in an organization that used Lotus notes, I mean, the problem was not the email component. That part was easy to migrate people over. It was the access features. It was these miniature standalone applications that people would build on the fly. And there was no, uh, you know, there was no migration uh, of those you had to, or, or even transformation of that. You had to completely go and re-architect. So it was, you know, cut it, move away, go build something new to do that same thing. And, yeah. and it was viewed, access was viewed as promising. Again, you'd have to re-architect it, but it, of a similar type capability. You could essentially go and map in and rebuild similar uh, small apps 
and then host those in SharePoint or wherever. So uh, I suspect Microsoft is probably trying to figure out what they're going to do with it. I, you know, as far as paths forward, access services, I don't see it growing. The need will never go away. Of course, there will always be a need for that sort of solution, but um, access services, I think I, I don't expect it to grow. And if anything, stay around too long. You know, of course, we, we're talking about it like this. We're, ta we're trash talking it. And there's a bunch of MVPs that are going to be writing letters. <laughs> to to Microsoft. Hate mail. Yeah. And it's, you know, look, in my, it, it's like my joke about, you know, the ham radio crowd uh, around it. It's like, look, you know, there's, uh, I mean, the fact that, that suddenly, you know, COBOL programming has been talked about in the news and stuff. There are communities where, uh, they all may hate COBOL, and I suspect they all do. Even the experts that work on it, even the babies. Yeah, it. it but it's but it's still around. It's uh, you know massive environments, especially in the financial systems that are uh, healthcare <laughs> yeah. sector and that insurance. Are it. Yeah. Yep. Um, I uh, worked for an organization that gave every new employee, or rather, every prospective employee coming in. Um. A COBOL test. This was as recent as, well, it wasn't really recent. Probably about 10 years ago. That's recent. I have no concept of time anymore. So, yes, that's recent. <laughs> Didn't I just see you in the dining hall, Sean, at SP TechCon Boston? It just happened, right? It was like six years ago. I have no idea. Horses end. Yeah, Hal has no idea what we're talking about there, but yeah, yeah. it's the <laughs> Hal. It was the the biggest fake band in the SharePoint community ever. Horses and rocks. Uh, okay. So. <laughs> I'm wondering whether I should turn the recorder on because something blackmailable here or not. <laughs> uh, uh, you're not going to get blackmail material. You'll get endless entertainment for people but uh, in fact here i'll have to for anybody watching is probably wondering what the crap are they talking about yeah Maybe, um i'll pull up the link i think of it it's when you put the uh when you turn the recorder on and ask me about horse's end <laughs> my response was genuine I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> uh, I have a few. Oh, there it is. It's the uh, yeah, the behind the music classic. Here, I'll share this out here. If anybody is is interested in uh, the kind of uh, the, the nonsense that we uh, do to pass time in between sessions at major events. Um, yeah, history of horses and yeah, SP TechCon Boston many yeah, years ago. That was uh, that was classic. All right, I posted it there, and here I'll uh, for Hal. You can check that out sometime when you when you've got a, a, a few minutes. We did a, a little uh, fake behind the music VH1, and it's mildly entertaining. I had less gray in my hair back then. And, Christian's creative streak. Yeah. In rare form. And uh, hanging out with uh, the, you know, the creativity just flows when you hang out with uh, Verosky. Verosky, yeah, no doubt. Well, let me clarify that. It's uh, you, uh, you can't, uh, you don't take anything seriously, nor are you serious. You act seriously when you're around Verosky. So. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I could work with him uh, professionally. I don't think like going into a client, we get into, you know, too many inside <laughs> yeah. jokes within inside jokes, the inside joke inception. And we go so deep, so quick uh, into our own minds and our jokes of what we thought were funny. And, you know, and uh, the, the, the client would be just standing there. Befuddled. Yes.
Al, do you know Jeff Vorosky? I'm sorry, who? Jeff Vorosky. I'm not sure. I have a big disconnect between names and faces most of the time. Gotcha. He's a fixture up in the New England SharePoint community. Good uh, guy. Yeah. It's a good guy. Uh, unless it would have been at uh, some kind of a gathering, probably not. No worries. He did make it down to Arkansas. Did he? Yeah. Ventura? Both he and M made it down to Arkansas for the last uh, uh, thing. Well, out Rackley's last bash that we had in person. I suspect now if you uh, put out an invite to speak, to talk about SharePoint slash woodworking, then he'd <laughs> submit first. Uh, probably. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. I mean, I'm going to scroll down through, see if there's anything else, any other questions. Anybody watching in, watching the live stream, seeing us, watching us over on Facebook or on YouTube? And you have any questions you'd like us to handle, just write in the comments and and uh, we'll we'll try to handle those. Um, that was where we were. I started reading about cricket. Uh, the game or the incense? <laughs> the game. Spence Harbor um, recommended two different books. And I got the second book in today. And <laughs> it's the book I should have started with. It's the one that explains the actual rules of the game. Um, actually, Cricket Explained. All right. Personal recommendation from Spence, so you it's know not as, it's, it's not as noob sounding as a cricket for dummies. So <laughs> no, it's not, and it has many pictures, yeah. illustrations of uh, positions. But I'm finally uh, uh, reading the the second half of it. Sat there uh, half read uh, Satya Nadella's book. So he talks a lot. Of course, he's heavily influenced by and uh, by by cricket. I know that's that's part of where the comments uh, that Spence and stuff are, you know kind of came from is uh, you know Satya mentions cricket every once in a while. I have to say that uh, when I was back in 2010, I was over in uh, Ahmedabad, India, and we went and saw uh, a the local team play, and it was a sweltering evening. I'll bet. With no breeze. And <laughs> oh. it was a packed stadium. And uh, it, it, so it was, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, oh, man, it was where you just – you Smelly man the crowd mess. And you see, like, the steam of the crowd, and you can <laughs> – it was kind of blurring the field over there. No, but it was the 2020 version, so much faster paced. And I have to say that I'm not a fan of baseball. Do not, do not like it. am I? Do not like it at all. Uh, the 2020 version of cricket is faster paced and I thought much more exciting than baseball. I really enjoyed it. And I've watched a few games of the 2020 format, which is that faster play um, since then. So, and I, and I know that, that uh, I'm sure Spence would not uh, agree with my comment of that, you know, about disliking it. He would, he would, uh, you know, probably you know, the, my preference for that format. He, I, I, I suspect he's more of a purist for the long form. I'm just learning about the game. So yeah, I brought home for my boys when they were younger. I brought home a, uh, I bought from a, a family selling cricket sets. You know, so not good quality at all, but on the side of the road, and they had some cute little kids and. I just kind of visited with this family and bought a set and brought it home. And uh, I think the second time we were playing with in the backyard and busted. <laughs> <laughs> busted it, so. But yeah, fun game. Oh, brother. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of questions. Um, people asking about different uh, things about, uh, you know, kind of fundamental courses. Um, 
people are asking about um, Azure fundamental courses, you know, what, what do people recommend? And, um, and there's a number of places to go. I mean, one thing I would say in general, if you're looking for training around um, Office 365, that one great resource, uh, especially if it's on like the, the collaboration side of the house, is Vlad, uh, Vlad Katrinescu, his blog. Um, you could go and it's what Vlad talks tech.com Vlad the impaler.com. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Vlad has, if you just Vlad V L a D and SharePoint, you'll find his site, but uh, where he gets most of his traffic is to his training guides. And so he's a plural site, uh, you know, trainer, um, at talks yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but just some fantastic resources out there and he keeps those up to date. Uh, as changes happen with the technology and especially around the curriculum, if you're looking to go and get certified on any of the products. So I would highly recommend, I'm not sure what he has out there in the Azure space, um, but that's a place to start. Um, go take a look. But um, here's one other question. Somebody's asking, and I don't know if either of you have experience with this, but somebody was asking, what's the best possible way to back up Office 365 online mailboxes? Backup. Office Backup. 65. Online mailboxes. Um, I, I've always got to ask you for free or. That's a great question. So yeah, because there are tons of third party tools that are out there. There's a number of vendors that have solutions for the major workloads. If you're looking to back up SharePoint or Exchange, um, there's vendors that have been around for 20 plus years that have been doing that. There's a lot of newfangled pure cloud vendors that have solutions. And so a lot of that depends on, as Sean says, free or do you want to pay a little? Do you want to, are you looking for something that's more granular, more comprehensive? Cause there are some high end, more expensive solutions as well that do a lot more, a heck of a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, it, the you know places I would go and recommend people go take a look at. I mean, I I, I always point to former clients that are in the space. Um, you know, you can check out AvPoint, check out Quest, um, check out Spanning. Veeam. Um, Veeam is another one. Um, wow. So yeah, the um, Spanning, which is all which is Datto and back, and they bought Backupify. So Backupify and Datto are both owned by um, spanning. Huh. I think that, yeah. I think they are, aren't they? Yeah. I'm not familiar. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's Dato, Dato and then spanning. Yeah. Anyway, I know everybody's going to buy everybody someday. We <laughs> know how it works, Christian. <laughs> yes. Sean and I have been through the ringer a few times. We've been bought. Yeah. <laughs> And not in a bad way. Yeah. Eh, well, yeah. <laughs> One of those was not very comfortable for me. Uh, that's true. I, <laughs> I believe we had a conversation about that. Yeah. When I think it's an indicator when you leave on the day <laughs> of the end of your agreement, like to that, the day, yes, to the, to the day, then that usually indicates he might not be happy with this situation. Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else? What else do we see in here? Let me just check, make sure there's not any questions posted somewhere. Uh, nothing there. And somebody else is commenting on Zoom. You know, and we've ta we talked about this last week of just biting the bullet, being, being, doing the more painful way of adding yet another technology platform. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just keep that. Just post that on your monitor. Pull it out every once in a while. Yes, we use Zoom. We do it. No, we don't hate live teams. Stream. We don't hate teams. We love teams. But we're live streaming 
and to live stream, you would have to use a third party tool, a non Microsoft technology to do it, what we're doing. And, uh, and so we, you know, do, do we have two points of failure or one, just use the one technology that it works most of the time. Keep it simple. Yeah. Keep it simple, simple Sean. Kiss. That's right. Keep it simple, Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Sean is simple. Yeah. Well, simpleton. You know, same difference basically. But yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> this program is as simple as I am. It's not a tumor. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what else? I kind of liked what we were talking about. We started going down the conversation, the path this morning about gaming as an educational resource. Are you doing any of that kind of stuff with your kids, Sean? Um, using it for that purposes, um, to, to learn to code, that kind of stuff, like Minecraft? Um, it has been a starter on a couple of occasions for that stuff, but unfortunately, my kids haven't taken interest in it. But um, we did do some, uh, we did start learning Python, so that we could develop Minecraft uh, mods and make changes to the game. Mm -hmm. um, but Minecraft EDU is a big thing. I know. Yeah, Python, of my, uh, my middle son, uh, Nick, uh, I'm pushing him towards that. He's added computer science with the data analysis focus as a minor. Oh, cool. Um, so he's an environmental science um, uh, major. And uh, I keep telling him, I said, look, grad school, I mean, he's a straight A kid. He's going to go to wherever schools he, he applies to. And sure. I said, go in there with, uh, about, if you know Power BI and can do uh, all of the data analysis stuff in the background, it's like, you're going to learn that you're during uh, you know, grad school. It's like, but you will be at an, a distinct advantage because you know, nobody else Absolutely. Know this. You know? Absolutely. And uh, so, yeah. He, no, his, his real reason when I suggested it was not because of that. It was because he's like, yeah, I'm bored. I'm getting straight A's. Like, I'm like, take more classes. Take <laughs> harder classes. <laughs> it was one of these kids. He, t he maxed out his load in high school of AP classes, got fives on everything. So the, the, whatever the highest grade is on AP classes. I yeah. didn't take AP classes. So. My, when I graduated, it was the first year they offered in my high school in Hillsboro, Ohio, rural Appalachia. Technically it is. It Did qualifies for rural Appalachian aid. Yes, it does. Wow. Uh, but that was the first year that they offered AP classes. I took AP Calc wow. and I got a passing grade. So I got my AP credit. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I've uh, I've thought about going um, though and, and taking a look at some of the resources for using gaming to to learn programming. It's like, look, I've, I've been close to thirty years in in tech. I've taken classes on Unix, on HTML, on and PHP. I've uh, you know I, I've you know, worked in the field and and picked up a bunch of useless technology skills that. Uh, yeah. You know, like like any, learning any language if you're not continuing to practice it and work on it. You know, and I've forgotten a lot of things, but uh, um, I thought you know I do like to be engaged in a class, be learning something. I'm doing some courses both through both LinkedIn and Plural Site right now, um, but especially in this time. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm not a is, is you were mocking me this morning for seeing me on Steam playing games once in a while. Um, not yet today, but tonight, you know. Um, I just, I can't sit and watch Netflix for hours. I just No, I, I'm that guy. I cannot do that either. Yeah, so. So, I'm with you. Yeah. How about you, Hal? You play any games? Uh... For the most part, lately it's been Angry Birds 2. Angry Birds 2? Yeah. Well, of course, they're the old classics. I'm still a free cell fanatic, so I've got I've got the Solitaire collection, and that's that's about as far as that goes. Uh, 
it uh, it it's something to do. But the thing of it is, I mean, I've, it's that's not Netflix all the time. Having been retired now for a little while is is not something I do anyway. It's, it's got to, uh, being part of the MVP program, they're, they're putting all sorts of seminars on lots of the time. So there's those to attend. Um, being an ex-broadcaster, there's a lot of those meetings that now, that's the Society of Broadcast Engineers. And every most markets have a local chapter. And of course, they've all got local meetings. But now that they can't meet locally anymore, there's a lot of those meetings that are now moving moving up here onto the internet. So the Online format, crazy. yeah. Um, there's uh, there's uh, my all-time always favorite is AnswersDikeMicrosoft.com. I mean, I can go in there and uh, pick a subject, and if it's something that I know, there's always questions to be answered. There's always questions that I don't know the answer to that I find intriguing that sends me off to, to Google and Bing and half a dozen other places trying to figure out, well, what is this exactly? And so, I mean, it's not really a matter of being a, a, being bored at what I'm doing. It, uh, and then there's meetings like this too. I really wasn't, into, wasn't in, a, in a position to do this much before I found out from Christian he was doing them. And, oh, my <laughs> golly, this is kind of fun. So what the heck, I'm, I'm here now. Well, you like Angry Birds, Hal. You ought to try Angry Birds in virtual reality. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's one thing that, that that I've got to get into yet. To, to some degree, for the uh, uh, there's a uh, an app on the uh, the Windows 10 computers from the store, about Outspace VR, that uh, has been getting some attention of late. Uh, the uh, the PowerPoint folks during this during the summit decided, and during one of the breaks, that they wanted to get together and try that. And uh, there's a bit of a learning curve to it, but that was kind of fun. Uh, the uh, Christmas bonus for the company I work for is an OptiQuest, which I have yet to get set up. But uh, I'm kind of I'm kind of a little leery because I'm afraid that I'm going to wind up spending so much time with that I, I lose my other stuff because I've heard I've heard stories. I have heard stories. Well, it's like anything else. Uh, I mean, you can definitely immerse yourself in it and get lost in it. But um, I. I know at first when I started playing with a, a lot of the VR stuff, I was on it an excessive amount of time. And now I just pretty much go down. In fact, I've had Half-Life Alex waiting for me downstairs for quite some time. And uh, I have not even tried it out yet. So, you know, it, it is worth your time, though, I think, to, to invest in a little bit in your VR. Hey, I've got one last question. We've got four minutes left, and it's a SharePoint-related question, sort of. Oh. Um, so see if, uh, if you guys can answer this. So somebody had posted and said, hey, I was wondering if it's possible to use a SharePoint location, uh, preferably a doc library, to store Office templates and make them available in Office like the featured templates. And so there's kind of two questions. I think the fir first part is, I mean, leveraging SharePoint and uh, and saving, you know, creating a library of office templates. I mean, of course, mm -hmm. that's no brainer. You can go and do that. But I think this question is really when you go into an office application and pull from like from within the the native experience those featured templates that Microsoft provides. Right. I don't know that you can add templates in a location where those are accessed. I don't know either, but that's an excellent homework assignment. Yeah, so we might try to answer that because I because I think the Come issue back there, next week. Yeah, that that because I think the issue there is that those uh, those documents that Microsoft provides is that Microsoft resource. I don't know that you can uh, you you can read. I don't believe you can redirect that. You over probably can't them. redirect it, but I'll bet you can possibly add additional sources to it. Yeah, the second half of the question was, you know, making that like permission based again, SharePoint thing. Yes, you can do that, but no, you can't then put it within that uh, within those the office workloads, the office apps. That so that I guess that's the question. We'll we'll see if we could find a, uh, a you know find an answer to that. It's fairly common though. Uh, there's been again, this was my entrance into the SharePoint world was. 
um, helping organizations build out project management organizations, so uh, you know PMOs. And part of that would be to go in and help them to clarify their project management methodology and, and gather all of their, uh, their templates and provide a kind of a single version of truth around those templates so that they ensure that everybody in the organization, if you go into a requirements document, they all looked exactly the same. They, you know, a, a, a business uh, analyst, uh, you know, review of, uh, you know, product review, they all looked exactly the same. Yeah. And you can certainly do that. And I think then it's just a matter of training people as they go and open up, you know, Word, and they're going to create a new document that they uh, put as their, one of their favorited locations, that shared <clears throat> template library. Right. But we can come up with... Uh, we'll see if there's anything... Some yeah, the get auto more information on that. Points to that. Yeah. Automagically, yeah. Automagically, yeah. That's a technical term, Sean. Is it? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, gentlemen, well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for everybody who uh, caught us on the live stream. And again, yes, thank if, you. if you have follow-up, if you think of a question and we're not live, go ahead and post them uh, and uh, or, or drop us a, a, a DM. Um, you know, in, in Facebook, go out to the Office 365 community on Facebook. It's a great place to ask questions throughout the week. Uh, there's tons of MVPs and experts from around the world that are on there at any given moment. And, and usually you'll have dozens of responses to whatever question you post. Um, and so it's a great place. And, and when we don't know the answer to a question, um, which is fairly often. <laughs> it, it, it can be often. Well, I'm not like not us, but I'm the community in general. <laughs> but but they'll actually you know, provide guidance. Like, hey, that's something that's actually out on user voice. So you know, it's on the roadmap. Or hey, it needs to be on the roadmap. It's a it's a great way to to garner support for posting something on user voice, getting people to upvote it to get Microsoft's attention. So. Uh, uh, it's a great yeah, place. Yeah, they pay attention to user voice these days. So yeah, they do. They do so much, but they do now. Yep, and uh, obviously, I, I can't be remiss if I didn't say that there's also out on the Microsoft Tech Community. It's a great location. It'll be a great day when we're able to live stream and share that live stream out on the Tech Community. Can't do that today. So all right, yeah. When, Progress think and that. is measured in small steps. Someday we'll have a native live streaming capability in Teams straight to tech community with simulcast to Facebook and YouTube. It's going to happen someday. Insert angelic choir and clouds. Oh. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a good evening. Talk to you soon. You Take bet. Care, Take guys. care. Bye. Bye. Bye.